call not the movies, date the daytime performance out of the park with Home Run. My name is Jeremy Evans, and I wrote Home Run because of the performance issues in the Ruby Standard Library. Basically, if you're trying to use the date and daytime classes in performance sensitive code, it's pretty much a swing and a miss. Now, Home Run basically destroys the performance in the standard library, especially on older versions of Ruby. I'm going to talk about how it does so a little bit later. But I think it's first appropriate to talk about the history of the standard date library in order to understand why it is written the way it is. So let's take a trip in the time machine, way, way back to Ruby 1.0 in 1998. And back in Ruby 1.0, date.rb was a fairly simple 228 line file written by Yasuo Oba. And it stored dates as year, month, and day integers. Now, this code is a simplified version of what was in Ruby 1.0. I think that other than one as the choice of the default for the year, it's not bad. Now, the date.rb file from 1.0 can actually be run unmodified on Ruby 1.8. And Ruby continued to use a modified version of this 1.0 code until Ruby 1.6.0 was released. Now, Ruby 1.6.0 included a new version of the standard date library written by Tadayoshi Funaba. And this is the ancestral version of the current standard date library. It stored the date as a Julian day integer. It supported a modifiable data calendar form, where Ruby 1.0 had a static data calendar form. Now, like the Ruby 1.0 code, the Ruby 1.6.0 code can also be run unmodified on Ruby 1.8, so it is about two thirds of the speed of the 1.0 code. Now, both the 1.0 code and the 1.6.0 code only handle dates, they do not handle date times. Support for date time was not added until Ruby 1.8.0. And in Ruby 1.8.0, the date and date time classes were pretty much the same. In order to handle fractional days, the date was now sort of rational, and it included a time zone offset, even though the dates themselves don't have fractional components or specific time zones. So basically, in Ruby 1.8 and in 1.9, date objects do not really represent dates. They represent date times, usually at midnight in UTC. Now the 1.8.0 version of date was about three times slower than the 1.6.0 version and four times slower than the 1.0 version. So from 1.0 to 1.6.0 to 1.8.0, date got slower. And since then, date has gotten a little bit faster. For example, in Ruby 1.8.7, instantiating date objects is about 46% faster than the 1.8.0. However, it's still half the speed of 1.6.0 and a third of the speed of 1.0. Now in Ruby 1.92, the code looks and performs pretty much the same way as it does in 187. And by that I mean, while Ruby 1.9 is much faster than 1.8, if you take the 1.9.2 date code and you run it on 187, it's about the same speed as the 187 date code. So let's shift gears for a second. I and mean, you assume you're writing some code and you want to speed it up. It's crawling and you cannot figure out why. You want it to go faster, but even after optimizing some of your application code, it's still not going as fast as you think it should. Well, first, you fail for not profiling first. And then when you decide to profile, you see that your application is not spending much time on your own code. It's spending almost all of its time instantiating date objects. So now instead of you failing, it's Ruby failing you. And there's not much you can do. You need to pass a date object to another API, and all you are doing is giving a year, month, and date integer to date.new, and you, just, you can't fathom why it's taking so long. So this basically explains your feelings at that point. You feel helpless because you have to pass in a date object, and there does not appear to be an easy way to create one, or a fast way to create one. Now, so at this point, you have three options. You can give up and resign yourself to slow code. And I expect that this is the path that most projects take. You can attempt to sort of work around date's performance issues by re-implementing parts of date and rational in order to speed things up. For example, let's take everyone's favorite Ruby ORM, Data Matter. Specifically, the data object adapters that run underneath it. If you peek under the hood, you'll see that most of the data object adapters re-implement parts of date and rational in C in order to improve performance. So these are the prototypes for the C functions that Postgres data object adapter uses, and most of the other data object adapters are similar. Now, I posit that many of these methods should not need to exist. There's no reason a date time or a database library should have to write their own date and time calculation functions for functions to reduce rational numbers. Now these functions probably should exist, but they should be small with simple implementations that either create a Ruby string and pass it to one of the date parsing functions or parse the string themselves and call one of the standard constructors. 
Now, unfortunately, in the request for decent performance, these methods are neither small nor simple. Now, this code is taken from the parse date time function. It attempts to do a greatest common denominator calculation in C. I call date's new bang method with a pre-computed astronomical Julian date because living the standard library doing calculation is a lot slower. Now, if the standard date library had decent performance, you would not need all this code. So data mapper is not the only database library that tries to work around date shortcomings. Swift is a fairly new Ruby database library, and because date is so slow, they skip calling date's constructors entirely. Typecast timestamp here parses the string in C and creates a Ruby time object. Then to date is called that time object in order to get the date. And Swift does this because it's faster to create a Ruby time object and convert it to a date using to date than it is to create a date object the standard way. C libraries are the most common places you'll see the overriding of date and date time code, but even some pure Ruby libraries do so. And this example was taken from Ruby OLE, which is a Ruby library for dealing with those ugly Microsoft formats like Office, pre-Office 2007 Word documents. And Ruby OLE has a file time class, which is a subclass of date time. And there are a couple things to note here. First is the comment right at the top, which says date time by being slow, faster version of file time. Second is the middle block where it re-implements the Julian date calculation. And the reason this is faster than letting the standard library do the calculation is that it uses a float instead of a rational to store the date. Now there are probably other examples of specific libraries that re-implement parts of date performance. Date performance was the first general library I'm aware of that attempted to improve date's performance. It was written in early 2007 by Ryan Tomeko, and it overrides a few of dates internal methods in C in order to improve performance. It made creating dates about five times faster, and it also overrode the string F time and string P time to use the C-level APIs directly if possible. And in the cases where the C-level APIs could handle it, formatting using string F time was about 12 times faster, and parsing with string P time was about 45 times faster. And because it kept the same data structure and just re-implemented some algorithms in C, there weren't many significant compatibility issues. <coughs> However, date performance only solved parts of date's performance problems. It didn't override any of the date time methods, so date time did not get significantly faster. It didn't speed up date up parts at all, and if the C string F time and string P time functions couldn't handle the format strings used, it was not significantly faster for them. So there are the first two options you can take if you want to improve slow date code. And the third option you can take is to write your own date and date time classes. Now my first attempt at this was called third base. It was written in late 2008 and it was a pure Ruby implementation. And it, it was about four times faster in creating dates and about three to 12 times faster at parsing and it had a lower memory footprint as well. It also supported pluggable parsers so you could write your own date parser and sort of plug it into date.parse. Now I used third base in production after creating it, but it never saw widespread use. It had some significant compatibility issues, and it just wasn't fast enough to justify them for most people. Anyway, since creating third base in 2008, I gained more experience programming in C. And in July of this year, I was itching to write a non-trivial Ruby C extension, and decided to give a shot at writing an API-compatible replacement for Ruby's day class in C. And because I had made my previous library third base, and had high hopes that the C library would be better, I called it Home Run. So before I jump into an explanation about why Home Run is so much faster than the standard library, let's take a step back and look at the big picture to determine the reasons why the standard date library is slow. Now there's a saying that computer science is about two things. The first is algorithms, and the second is data structures. And it's my belief that the number one reason why instantiating date objects is slow is because of the choice of data structure used to store it. So the standard date library stores both dates and date times as three separate pieces of data. The first is the astronomical Julian date. And there are two reasons why using the astronomical Julian date is slow. The first is that most users are going to be creating dates using the standard Gregorian calendar of years, months, and days. So you need to do a fairly expensive conversion calculation just to instantiate the object. The second issue is that Ruby does not have a fast, arbitrary precision number class. A float does not have high enough precision to store the astronomical Julian date, as it is not able to get nanosecond level resolution for times at any recent date, and dates far in the future would have less precision. Big decimal would be a possibility, and on Ruby 1.8, it's actually about four times faster than rational. However, on Ruby 1.9, rational is implemented in C, 
It's about two and a half times faster than big decimal. And in any case, the choice was made to store the astronomical Julian date as a rational. And incidentally, rational being implemented in C is the number one reason why home run provides less of a speed up on U1.9. So the use of a rational to store date times at least makes sense. For date objects, I really don't think it does. I mentioned earlier that dates in the standard library are stored pretty much as date times, which means that if you add a fractional part to a date, you may get something that looks like the same date, or you may get something that looks like a different date. So let's say you take a date returned by date dot today. If you add half a day to it, you appear to get the same day. But if you add another half day, you appear to get a different day. Now the second piece of data that all standard date and date time objects store is the offset from UTC. Now for date times, this makes sense. As they need to be able to store an offset, it needs to be able to accurately compare date times in different time zones. However, I don't think dates themselves should have an offset because a date is not a particular time in a particular zone. It's a 24 hour period, usually not particular to any one zone. So in general, if you need to be talking about a zone, you're probably going to be talking about a date time and not just a date. In any case, in the standard library, the offset for a date object is always zero unless you want to call some private methods. Now another strange result related to offsets is when you mix date and date time objects in calculations. Take the given calculation. You have a date time for the day at noon local time. You subtract from it a date object for today's date. What do you expect to receive? Anyone? Well, my personal intuition is that you should receive one half, since the date time is half a day ahead of the time, or ahead of the date. But that isn't what you get with the standard library. You get three quarters, since the date is in UTC and the date time is in local time. So what it does here is it converts the date to local time, making it 6 p.m. yesterday, which is 18 hours or three quarters of a day before today at noon. So let's say you go the extra mile, and you want to try to ensure that the date you create has a time or an offset. It won't matter because both the time and the offset will be ignored. So in short, mixing dates and date times using the standard library is going to result in problems unless your date times are also in UTC. So the third and final piece of data that the standard date library stores is the data calendar form being used for the given date. Now the data calendar form is the data that switch over from the old Julian calendar to the current Gregorian calendar. Now the Julian calendar was first used in 45 BC, and it was very similar to the current Gregorian calendar, except that it had leap years in years divisible by 100. Now in October 1582, Pope Gregory XIII issued what's called a Papel Bull specifying that the Gregorian calendar be used henceforth. And the Gregorian calendar made years divisible by 100, but not 400, non-leap years. And in order to correct for the accumulated error, they skipped 10 days, so that the day after October 4th was October 15th. Now most of the Catholic countries adopted the Gregorian calendar quickly. England and its commonwealth adopted it in 1752, and Russia did not adopt it until 1918, which is the reason the Russian October Revolution is actually celebrated in November. Anyway, standard date library allows each date object to have its own data calendar form. And that's right, a date object does not just store whether it is a Julian date or a Gregorian date, it stores what date should be the date of calendar form in reference to that date, so if you add or subtract some days or months to or from the date, it knows when to automatically switch from being a Julian date to being a Gregorian date, or vice versa. But you think about that. Is that really necessary? I think it's about as helpful as a sixth finger. <laughs> well, I'll take a step back and ask who really cares about the data calendar form at all? And I don't think anyone cares. That's not quite true. Someone probably cares. I mean, I think Yasuo Oba and Tadayoshi Fanaba, they probably cared. Anyone dealing with historical dates that uses the Julian calendar probably cares. However, the vast majority of Rubyists, I'm guessing over 99%, do not and should not care. And why should 99% of us suffer to make the job of 1% easier? Wouldn't it be better to have separate classes that deal with other calendars? It's not like handling all, you know, Julian and Gregorian calendars handles all cases anyways. According to Wikipedia, there were over 40 calendars in active use, and over 20 known historical calendars no longer in active use. So we talked about the issues with the standard date library in terms of the data structure. So, and that's most of the reason for the slowness in instantiating data objects. 
In many cases, the algorithms that the standard library uses and the ones used by Home Run are pretty much the same. So Home Run does implement them in C. Now there are a few problematic algorithms used in the standard library. And most of them have to do with converting to or from strings. So the date string f time instance method is known to be quite slow. It uses the block form of the string g sub instance method and breaks every match into three parts. It builds a hash of options for every match and for each of the recognized formats, calls another method to create the replacement string, and those methods are not fast either. Now, if this wasn't bad enough, the string f time method also calls itself recursively in many cases, including the case where the default argument is used. Now, I'm not saying this code sucks. It's actually pretty decent in terms of reuse, but from a performance standpoint, it's pretty bad. It also lacks comments, and it's not really easy to figure out what is going on. I, I posit that it's not a very good example of it in variable naming, and since these options hashes are not used in this method itself, you basically have to trace the code and figure out, you know, remember what's going on. Uh, these options also aren't documented anywhere, and I don't think anyone actually uses them, which is why they try to waste time figuring out what they do, and that's the reason Home Run does not implement them. So like string f time, the date string p time class method is another method with known performance issues. And one of the reasons it is slow is because it uses a date format bag instance to hold some temporary data. And this class is actually just like a hash, except it's much slower. Its only benefit is that it allows you to use regular name methods instead of using the hash, getter, and setter methods. So later on in the method, it calls the string p time i method that does the majority of the work. And this method looks very similar to the string f time instance method, which uses the block form of the string scan instance method with nested regular <coughs> expressions and recursion that allow for reasonably succinct but fully performing code. <coughs> Now this is the slightly nicer API that the date format bag instance gives you. And unfortunately, the code pays a performance penalty for using it. If you use a plain hash for temporary data and use the standard hash setter method like this, it gives you an instant 25% performance improvement. I submitted a simple patch that does this, but it was rejected by Tadayoshi without a clear explanation as to why. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not, I'm not still <laughs> Right, the final slow method I'd like to discuss is the parse class method. And this starts off similarly to string p time, duping a string and creating a new format bag instance to hold some temporary data. But just a side note that here in parse, using a plain hash instead of a format bag, the format bag speeds things up about 50%. Alright, I am actually a little bitter about that. And maybe that's because I think the speed up is greater and parse is used a lot more than string p time. Anyway, back up. After creating the bag, it tries to remove unwanted characters from the string. And then it tries to parse out a time component and a day name from the string. Now, I won't go into details about the parse time and parse day methods, but they both use regular expressions for parsing. After that, it tries to parse out the, the, the date using a bunch of different date formats in the serial. So if your string matches the regular expression used by parse DDD at the end, its parsing is a lot slower than if it matches the string used by parse EU at the top. And almost all of these regular expressions are not bounded to the beginning or end of the string. So with every step, it scans the entire string looking for a match. There's actually more step after this, including a couple more regular expressions, but it's not really not the most interesting code. So we should probably stop here. Because this is a presentation about home run, and I've already spent way too much time talking about the standard library. So let's jump into the design of home run, why it's so much faster, and the trade-offs that result. I mentioned earlier that the number one reason why the standard data library is slow is because of the choice of data structure. And it follows that the main reason that Home Run is much faster is because of the choice of data structure used to store it. Now this is the C data structure that Home Run stores dates in. And one of the main reasons it is faster is that it stores the year, month, and day information directly, sort of like Ruby 1.0. So if you are instantiating a symbol date using a year, month, and day, it does not have to convert it to a Julian date before storing it. It stores the Julian date separately as a long integer. Now the Julian date is necessary for some calculations, such as adding or subtracting a given number of days from a date. Now the last piece is a flags object, which just stores whether or not the JD field or the year, month, and day fields have been filled in. And because the information can be stored in two separate ways, there are two conversion macros used in most of the internal functions. These conversion macros check the flags field, and if the flags do not indicate the needed data has already been filled in, it calls a conversion function to populate the year, month, and day fields using the JD field, or vice versa. So 
let's jump back to the data structure and notice the absence of a few things. First, there is no storage of fractional dates. That's because in home run, dates are dates. They're not daytimes in disguise. Also missing is a time zone offset. Because a date, unlike a time, is not specific to a time zone, home run does not store an offset. Finally, note that the data calendar form is not stored because home run always uses the Gregorian calendar and then four can avoid storing it. Now there are a few trade-offs with this method of storage. The first is that it could be more memory efficient by either not caching the Julian date or the Sybil date, or by packing the month and day information inside the year. And doing either of those would be more CPU intensive. And since Ruby takes about 20 bytes of memory for every object, saving two to six bytes, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Another trade-off is that because the C structure is used, there is a range limitation. Home run has only about a 10 million year date range on the qubit systems. Now, I find this limitation is not an issue for most people, especially considering that the use of the Gregorian calendar means that home run is not suitable for dates before 1582. Now home run uses a different structure for date times. It stores the same fields as dates, but adds additional fields for storing the time and the time zone. Similar to how the year, month, and date fields are stored separately from the Julian date, the date-time structure stores the time component of a date in two separate ways. So the first is the nanos field, which stores the number of nanoseconds since midnight as a 64-bit integer. And the second is the hour, minute, and seconds fields. Now, storing the time component of the date-time is done for the same reasons that storing the date field is done in two separate ways for dates. It means that the user gives the hour, minute, and seconds does not need to be converted before being stored. Now one trade-off here is that the number of nanoseconds for the given second is not cached. So that does have to be calculated from the nanos field if it is needed. And I find that it's not needed very frequently, and it is a fairly simple modulo calculation, so I do not think it was worth adding another field to the structure. Now another trade-off is that because we are storing the nanos as an integer, the lowest resolution for home run date times is a nanosecond. Now, considering that Ruby time objects also only store nanoseconds in Ruby 1.9 and microseconds in Ruby 1.8, this seems like acceptable. Now, there is a small negative side effect for not handling fractional nanoseconds. For example, if you use the step instance method with the step value of 1 7, the final yielded object here will show up as a different date because the object will represent the final nanosecond of today's date instead of the first nanosecond of tomorrow's date. And this is because 1 7 of the day includes fractional nanoseconds, which get lost at each step. Finally, the time zone offset is stored in a 16-bit short integer, as the number of minutes differs from UTC. Now, one trade-off of storing the offset in minutes is that time zones with fractional minutes are not supported. I don't believe there are any time zones in active use that use fractional minutes, but some historical ones, such as Liberian time and Amsterdam time, did. Now another issue with home run storing the offset in the C structure is that there is also a range limitation. Home run actually enforces a 14 hour maximum offset from UTC, since that is the largest offset in current use. Now this is very different than standard library, which will accept any offset. Standard date library will accept an offset that is more than a year in terms of time. Home run will recognize that that is an error and will appropriately raise an exception. Another trade-off is that because two separate structures are used and they have different layouts, you cannot use the date and date time structures interchangeably in C code. This means that many methods that are defined in date and inherited by date time in the standard library need to have separate versions written for both date and date time <coughs> in one line. Now, the final trade-off I'd like to mention is that because a C structure is used and date and date time objects are supposed to be immutable, home run does not work with the allocate class method. And for the same reasons, it doesn't use Marshall dump and Marshall load, instead of implementing the old style dump and load methods. So now that I've talked about the data structure of the standard library that Home Run uses, let me talk about the algorithms it uses that make it faster than the standard library. I think we've all heard the phrase that no code is faster than no code. And one of the benefits of Home Run's data structure is that you do not need to run conversion algorithms in many cases. For example, Let's take this, this date, which adds two months to today's date. Now, the standard date library needs to convert the date to a Julian date in the constructor, convert it back to a civil date to add the months, add two months to the civil date to get a new civil date, and convert that back to a Julian date in order to store it. With home run, the initial storage is done directly with the civil date, and the addition of months uses the civil date, so no conversion to or from a Julian date is ever done. 
I mentioned earlier that most of the actual problematic algorithms in the Ruby standard library are the conversions to and from strings. A home runs approach to these methods is to avoid the use of regular expressions and to keep the code simple with an eye towards performance at the expense of some verbosity. So here's some code taken from home runs implementation of the string f time instance method. It's basically a simple string scanner. It loops through each character of the format string. If the character was preceded by a percent sign, the mod flag is set, and there is a simple switch statement on the following character. Now, each modifier character has its own branch in the switch statement, and almost all characters are handled by a construction like this, where S print F is used to append characters to the return string. Now, for those of you familiar with C, this may look slightly unsafe taken in isolation, but Home Run does show that there are at least 64 characters in the available buffer, and none of these uh, S print F calls should produce more than 64 characters of output. So the cases where compound modifiers, such as capital F, are used are handled by specifying all the arguments in the S print F function call. This is faster than using a recursive function call, but it is a little bit more verbose. Now the string P time class method is handled very similar to the string F time instance method, but it is a bit more complex. Instead of using S print F to format a string, it uses S scan F to read from the input string and assign values to local variables. If the values are assigned correctly and, state, and they are valid, the state variable is updated with the field that is set. Now, for format modifiers that can be used in compound modifiers, such as lowercase m for the month, is a little bit more involved. In order to avoid a ton of redundant code, macros are defined and immediately called. And this allows compound modifiers, such as capital F, which parses the year, month, and day in an ISO 8601 format, to be written as a series of macro calls. And the reason these have to be macro calls instead of calls to another function is that all data is stored in local variables instead of a C structure. Now, Home Run does actually borrow some code from the Ruby standard library. Because of the complexity of the standard library's parsing code, I determined it would be very difficult and error prone to rewrite it in C and keep full backwards compatibility. So, Home Run uses a modified version of the standard library's parsing code with two important modifications. A simple modification is just using a plain hash instead of a date format bag instance, which provides an instant 50% speed up without any drawbacks. The second and more interesting part is that before attempting to do any parsing in Ruby, it calls the ragel parse method. Now this method is implemented in C and uses the, the ragel state machine compiler. Hopefully most of you are familiar with ragel, uh, sort of made famous in the Ruby community by Zed Shah's use of it in the Mongol HTTP parser which was also used by Thin, <coughs> Unicorn, and other Ruby web servers. It was also used by Y as the scanner for HTTP. Anyway, if you haven't heard of Ragel, or if you have and just aren't sure what it is, Ragel basically compiles a state machine, sort of like a regular expression, that you specify using the Ragel domain-specific language. Now, the Ragel DSL is more verbose than an equivalent Ruby regular expression. It's more powerful in some ways, and it's less powerful in others. It's more powerful in that you can embed arbitrary code at any point in the scanning process. And it's less powerful in that it doesn't support features like backtracking. And if you want to get the equivalent of submatches, you have to implement them yourself using actions. So implementing submatches is a common need, and the most common need in Home Run's date parser. And Ragel makes it pretty easy. So let's just take this first line. This creates a Ragel machine named CLF year that will parse four digits, optionally preceded by a minus sign. Now, Ragel supports numerous state machine actions for each machine. And one of the most common actions is the entering action, which is called when the machine is entered. So when the CLF year machine is entered, the action tag CLF year is called. That action just sets a local variable that I have inside the parsing function to the current value of Ragel's pointer. And this marks the beginning of the submatch. Most of the other machine entering actions are similar. Now, in some cases, you would also want to add a finishing action that would mark the end of the submatch, but that's not needed in most cases by home run state parser. So most ragout machines are built out of other ragout machines, such as this one named CLF Datetime, which is a machine for the entire Apache common log format. And this machine accepts the CLF date format, optionally followed by the colon in the CLF time format and optional white space. So if the input string ends in one of the CLF date times final states, this set parser CLF action will be called. And this action is, sets the parser's local flag variable to include the CLF parser. 
So after the ragdoll parser finishes, there's a switch statement on the parser's flag variable. And if the CLF parser matches fully, it will execute this C code. Now most of the C code is just taking the saved pointer positions for all of the submatches of the string, which were set by the machine entering actions, and converting them to long integers. And then it sets flags for the local variables to, local variables to which it assigned values. All right, those flags are used later in order to set Ruby values and those return hash. Here the year local variable is converted to a Ruby integer and assigns the value of the year Ruby symbol key. Anyway, I probably covered that way too quickly, but you could really have a whole conference just about Ragdoll. Home Run uses just the very basis, basics of Ragdoll's capabilities, but it enables Home Run to parse many times faster than the Ruby standard library if you were using one of the formats that the Ragdoll parser understands, which is currently ISO 8601, RFC 2822, HTTP, and the Apache Common Log format. So thanks to a better data structure and faster algorithms, what kind of a speed up does home run give you? Well, instantiating date objects is about 14 to 66 times faster, depending on your version of Ruby. For date time objects, instantiation is 17 to 146 times faster. String F time is 62 to 104 times faster. String P time is 23 to 71 times faster. Parsing is 25 to 56 times faster for formats supported by the Ragdoll parser and 50% faster for other formats. A calculation, calculation such as adding or subtracting a given number of days or months are between 3 and 220 times faster. So with the number of times speed that Home Run gives you, if the standard date library is a slow car, then Home Run is a rocket. And that's, that's not really fair, unless the only thing your app does is handle dates. In that case, you probably already wrote this. In my own application, I've seen speed in increases of three to four times for certain database queries just by using Home Run. So if the standard date library is a slow car, then Home Run is the Bugatti Veyron Supersport, the world's fastest street legal production car. But Home Run is not just faster than the standard library, it's also more memory efficient. Even though it stores the date and time information in two separate ways, by tightly packing the information in a C structure, it's about two to six times more memory efficient than the Ruby standard library. In addition to being more memory efficient, Home Run also creates 11 to 66 times less garbage for the Ruby garbage collector to clean up, which contributes to its speed. Now, Home Run was mostly written for performance. It attempts to have an API that's as close as possible to the Ruby standard library. However, there is one mistake that the standard library makes that I think is so bad it must be corrected. And the mistake is how it parses a date like this. Now, in Ruby 1.8, this is parsed successfully as Christmas. But if you upgrade to Ruby 1.9, you'll find that Ruby has stabbed you in the back. <laughs> Since parsing that date, you now raise an argument error. Because Ruby 1.9 switches the slash separated date format to assume day, month, year, instead of the previous month, day, year, breaking the parsing to the most common American date format. Now, I'm not saying that month, day, year is correct, because a lot of other countries do use day month here. But for Ruby to break your code and give you no easy way to fix it is very troubling. Now thankfully, Home Run, like Domino Man, can come to the rescue. So using this cryptic code, you can once again have correct American date format parsing on Ruby 1.9. And while the Ruby 1.8 library won't correctly handle slash separated dates in day month year format, you can use this code to Home Run, and you basically get correct date parsing on Ruby 1.8. So at this point, I'd like to shift gears again and just talk about a few things that I learned while writing Home Run. As I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons I wrote Home Run was to get more experience writing non-trivial Ruby C extensions. And one of the reasons for this is that I really didn't know C as well as I wanted to, and that showed in a few places. Otherwise, there were a couple of things that tripped me up. For example, consider the following expression, which is the module of a negative integer by a positive integer. If you mostly program in Ruby, you are probably used to this returning positive 6. But in C90, the result is implementation dependent, and in C99, the result is negative 4. Now in Home Run, the module is used in various places, like determining the day of the week, given the Julian date, which should be returned as a positive integer. Since the negative Julian dates were supported, I ended up having to write my own module function in C to emulate Ruby's, but even if a positive number, a plus number will always be returned, even if you be given it as negative. And another thing that tripped me up was the formatting of 64-bit integers in string app time. I was originally using code like this, which worked fine until I tested it on Windows. 
And it turns out that on Windows, this is not supported. To work on, you know, basically to get portable code, you have to include the int type stage header file and use this format string. And this actually looked a little bit odd to me, since it's a literal string and that what that looks like a constant. And the reason this works in C is that PRI D64 is actually a macro that is resolved to a literal string by the C preprocessor, and C automatically concatenates literal strings when they're separated by white space. Now I remember when writing my first few Ruby C extensions, I had a lot of problems with memory leaks. And I decided to take an approach to memory management in home run that made it so I didn't really have to worry about leaking memory. Now almost all Ruby programmers know that Ruby has a garbage collector that makes it so you don't really have to worry about memory management. I mean, there's basically only three ways to leak memory in Ruby. You either keep a reference to an object without meaning to, you use a C extension that leaks memory, or you find a bug in the interpreter that's leaking memory. Now leaking memory in C extensions is very easy. Here's a simple, stupid example. You take a C string and you want to create a Ruby string for the first three characters. This leaks because string and dupe calls malloc which allocates new memory, but the return value is passed to RB string new 2 and never free. So basically, if you are a Ruby C extension programmer, malloc is your enemy. And how do you fight such an enemy? Well, you replace your enemy malloc by your good friend, the Ruby garbage collector. If you let the Ruby garbage collector do all of your work, you never call malloc or another C function that calls malloc, your C extension cannot leak memory. So, print this wide reference. Other C extension writers may think this is inconceivable. But Mario knows that you can do this. So how do you write a C extension that does not leak memory? Or that basically never calls malloc directly? Well, there are two techniques, both really simple, that allow you to do this. The first is just to use local variables to allocate them in the stack whenever you can. Duh, for a C programmer. In this example, instead of a pointer to a Ruby date structure being used, the entire structure is used, and the address of that structure is passed to the fill commercial function. And since it's the structure is allocated on the stack and not on the heap, the memory is automatically free when the function returns. Now, if you can't allocate on the stack, the easiest way to avoid Ruby leaking memory is to wrap the data structure in a Ruby object, even if that Ruby object is only used temporarily. And a simple example of this is in the string at time function. Now, home run first allocates the initial Ruby string for the output string using RB string buck new. Now, this function creates a Ruby string with zero length but with a C buffer of at least that number of characters. So then home run grabs a pointer for that string's buffer. Every time it needs to expand the length of the string, it creates a new Ruby string that is twice as long and copies the data from the current string and then switches the pointer over to the new Ruby string's buffer. So the final Ruby string created can be returned to the caller of the method and all other temporary strings will be garbage collected the next time Ruby garbage collector runs. So I'd like to close out the presentation with a so a short discussion about how the development of Home Run has affected the greater Ruby ecosystem. Home Run was originally developed on the official Ruby interpreter, starting with 1.8 and then adding support for Ruby 1.9. During the development of Home Run, I found bugs in a couple of corner cases of dates and date times methods, and I submitted patches for them, which were both applied fairly quickly. I next attempted to port Home Run to Rubinius, and because Rubinius did not support all the C API features I was using, I had to submit bugs and patches to the Rubinius project in order to add support for those features. And those were also applied quickly. So Rubinius became the second Ruby implementation to pass all home run specs. And finally, I attempted to get home run working with JRuby some C extension support. And this was, this was back in early August, before the C extension support had been finished and merged into JRuby's master branch. And like with Rubinius, I had to add some extension methods that were not yet implemented. And my patch for that was applied quickly, and then JRuby became the third Ruby implementation to support home run. It even caused some changes in data mapping, which was using rational without directly requiring it. And that works if you're using the standard library, since the standard date library requires rational. But it breaks if you use home run, since home run does not require rational. So the data mapping developers agreed that this was a problem when I reported an issue to them, and now the object adapters require rational directly. So as the sun sets on this presentation, I actually remember just three things. Data structures can be more important than algorithms. Malloc is your enemy, and try not to be bitter when the patches are not accepted. <laughs> and that wraps up my presentation. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present here at RubyConf. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have now.